This is the Canon R50. This is the new entry-level mirrorless interchangeable lens camera from Canon at $679. This is basically the RF mount replacement of the EFM mount M50, which has been an extremely popular camera in the past few years. I've won a few of these myself, and I've also recommended it to a bunch of people because it is a very versatile camera that is very easy to use and carry and also very affordable. So it's been loved by photographers and videographers at all levels so is the r50 a worthy upgrade from the m50 is it going to be the new bestseller entry-level camera well we're going to find out today and before we get started i would like to thank bnh for lending me this r50 and after watching this video if you think this is the right camera for you please check out their website through the link down below and if you make a purchase through the link you're not only supporting a great business i also get a small commission from the sales which helps me continue to provide you contents like this for free and now let's get back to the camera. So my first impression of the camera is that it obviously feels very similar to the M50 and it's roughly the same size and weight and it's actually about 12 grams lighter than the M50 and the button layouts are also very similar. Pretty much the only meaningful difference in design is that there used to be an M function button at the top but now that's replaced by an ISO button which I thought was very interesting because if I remember correctly the only other Canon camera with a dedicated ISO button is the R7. It's not on the R10, it's not on the R5 or the R6, or even on the new R8, but it's just on this and the R7, so I thought that was very random. It also has a pop-up flash, similar to the M50, which is nice to see, but I personally prefer the spring-loaded type of flashes like the one on the M200 or the Sony A6000 series because you can tilt those back to bounce them off the ceilings instead of always facing front. And one thing to note here, Canon has switched the hot shoe with their multifunction accessory shoe. So if you'd like to use a standard external flash, now you need to buy a $40 adapter. The viewfinder resolutions remain the same at 2.36 million dots, but the monitor resolutions got a nice upgrade from about 1 million dots to 1.6 million dots, and the screen quality seemed pretty decent for its price range. I had no trouble using the screen outdoors on a sunny day. And like all Canon cameras, the screen is very responsive to touch, no complaints there whatsoever. The ports are also very simple. We have a microphone jack on one side and the USB-C and micro HDMI on the other. This being such a small camera, they're not in the most ideal positions. The microphone can block the screen rotation and it can be very tricky to hold the camera when either the USB or the HDMI ports are being used. I guess most typical buyers of this camera won't be building a full-on video rig with this camera, but if you are one of those people, it's something to be aware of. And we have one UHS-1 SD card slot in the battery compartment at the bottom. Obviously, I prefer card slots on the side, but I don't think that was a possibility on such a small body. The battery is actually different from the M50. The R50 uses the LPE17 battery, which is slightly bigger than the one on the M50, the LPE12. So theoretically, you should get anywhere between 10 to 15% more battery life with the R50. Moving on to the internals, the R50 is equipped with the new Digic 10 processor or the Digic X processor and a 24 megapixel sensor. And there's no internal sensor stabilization, but I think that's okay for this price range and all the kit lenses have image stabilization. With the new processor, the R50 also got a big upgrade in the shooting speed. It can now shoot up to 12 frames per second or 15 with the electronic shutter. The M50 could technically shoot up to 10 frames per second, but that was only in one shot AF mode. And while tracking moving subjects, realistically you could only get about five or six shots per second but both cameras have very small buffers so neither of them are really ideal for shooting fast action or sports the m50's autofocus was already one of the best in its class and the r50's autofocus improves upon that with smoother continuous tracking and now it can automatically 
detect various subjects like animals and vehicles, not just human faces. Also, while shooting video, the camera knows when to switch focus between subjects. So for example, right now, I'm shooting this video on my Sony camera, and if I hold up an object like this, the camera still focuses on my face because that's what it's tracking and that's what it's supposed to do. And if I want the camera to focus on the object that I'm holding, I need to hide my face behind the object so the camera can't detect my face anymore. And you've probably seen some food vloggers do this. And if I move this out of the way, it focuses on my face again. But with the R50, even without having to hide my face, when it sees an object closer to the camera, it automatically focuses on that. But this is a great feature for vloggers and product reviewers who are not necessarily expert camera operators, since they won't have to constantly check if the camera is focusing on the right things while shooting video. Now let's take a look at some images. With the new processor, the R50's maximum native ISO was increased from 25,600 to 32,000, which should theoretically improve low light performance, and that actually was the case. From mid to high range ISOs starting around 3200, it was subtle, but the R50's images definitely had less noise, and the differences were much more amplified as we moved up higher. If you look at the hand or the shoelaces, you can see the R50's image maintains a bit more details and definition. And when you manipulate the exposures with the RAW files, you're going to have a little more latitude to work with with the R50's files, especially when raising the shadows. As you can see, raising Using the shadows 5 stops, there's a lot more noise on the M50's image. I mean, these are pretty extreme cases and most people won't notice the difference in normal usage, but it is a pretty big improvement nevertheless. But the biggest upgrade on the R50 in my opinion is in its video capabilities. The M50 was a very good video camera because of its ease of use and the amazingly reliable autofocus, but in 4K there was a heavy crop and its autofocus became pretty much unusable, so it was mostly just a 1080p camera. But with the R50, you can shoot up to 4K 30 without crop, and the autofocus works just as well as in any other modes, and it's a 6K oversampled 4K, so the image quality is also great. And if you like to shoot a lot of slow-mo videos, the M50 could only do 120 FPS in 720 without autofocus, but the R50 can do it up to 1080 with autofocus. And finally, Canon has gotten rid of the 30 minute video recording limit. And when I used to shoot videos like this with an M50, I always had to constantly check if the camera was still recording. But now the R50's recording time is increased to one hour. So it's not unlimited like some Sony cameras, but having to press the button only every hour is still a huge upgrade from having to do it every 30 minutes. So a huge upgrade from the M50 in terms of video features, but there's one caveat here, and that is overheating. Unfortunately, despite the longer recording limit, this being such a small and light camera, when you're shooting 4K, I couldn't quite reach the full hour. It overheated and stopped recording at around 55 or 57 minutes, which isn't bad, but I couldn't start shooting again until the camera was completely cooled off. This was in a relatively warm room in low to mid 70s, so depending on the temperature, it might go a little longer or shorter. So if you need to shoot longer videos, you should probably use 1080 because it did not overheat while shooting 1080. Well, the temperature did get a bit warm after about an hour and 45 minutes, but the battery ran out before the camera actually overheated and stopped working. Currently, the biggest weakness of the R50 is the lens selection. The RF mount is still relatively new, and right now the kit lenses are about the only crop sensor lenses available. And the new kit lens is actually a bit of a downgrade from the EFM mount kit lenses because the old lens had the range of 15 to 45 with the 3.5 to 6.3 aperture, but the new lens only starts at 18 millimeters at f4.5. A 3 millimeter difference on the wide end is actually pretty significant, especially on a crop sensor body. And the, considering the size didn't change much, I'm not sure why that was necessary. And other than some full frame lenses like the 51.8 or the 16 2.8, there's not a lot of small and light and affordable fast primes for this camera. There's the 35 1.8, which is $500, and the 24 1.8, which is $600. 
But at the time of recording this, Canon still does not allow third-party manufacturers to make autofocus lenses for the RF mount cameras, and that's the biggest drawback compared to the M50 or the Sony E mount or even the Nikon Z mount. I mentioned that the R50 has slightly better low light performance than the M50, but with the M50, you can get the Sigma 1.4 primes, which you cannot get for the R50. There isn't even any 1.4 primes for the RF mount crop sensor bodies right now, period. So the improved low light performance is a bit meaningless at this point because of the lack of lens selection, and I hope that changes in the near future. So in conclusion, when you look at the camera by itself, the better autofocus and massively improved video specs make the R50 a great value for money and the great replacement for one of the best-selling entry-level cameras on the market. However, until we see some more lens options from Canon, the R50 won't be able to reach its full potential just yet. I do realize that most first-time camera buyers won't start collecting a bunch of lenses the moment they buy their first camera, so if you're willing to be patient, I'm sure the kit lenses or some of the primes that I mentioned will be good enough. And if you get it as a bundle, you can get the camera and the 18 to 45 for $7.99, or if you also get the 55 to 210, that's $10.25. So overall, you get about a $300 discount. I normally don't recommend people to get the kit lenses, especially at full price, but with the discount, it might be worth it, especially if you're just getting started and because there's just not many other options available. And if you're an existing M50 user considering upgrading to the R50, it might be better to wait until Canon releases more lenses unless you really want 4K video. You're not going to see a dramatic improvement on still image quality. If you want more noticeable difference, you should probably consider moving up to full frame at this point. But like the M50, I like that Canon is still coming out with more small and light and affordable camera bodies. Although the EFM mount is technically dead, I'm glad that Canon hasn't abandoned that strategy. So I hope to see more cameras and lenses in the segment from Canon in the near future. And I also hope that they open up their lens mounts to their parties again because that's seriously holding them back right now. So that's going to be it for me today and if you'd like to know more about the M50 or if you have any more questions just leave a comment down below and I'll try to get to them all and thank you for watching and I will see you on the next video. Bye bye.